the word here in Hebrew is the word for obey. Obey your father's correction and listen to the teaching of your mother. Mom and dad are the very first lesson. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. We are back today with Dr. Mark Hamby and having a great discussion um, about some pretty deep things this week. And this is really exciting. We're, we're talking about um, the things that we're putting into our minds and therefore into our, our hearts, right? I mean, because that's really what this is all about. You know, Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance; from from it flows the springs of life. And so we want to be really careful about what we are putting into our minds and into our hearts. And and even more importantly, what we're putting into our kids' minds and into their hearts. But before we jump back into this discussion with um, Mark, I want to thank our sponsor, CTC Math. If you guys are looking for a great math curriculum, go to ctcmath.com and check them out. You can try a free, um, a few free lessons on their website. You will love them just like our family does, ctcmath.com. Uh, Mark, welcome back to the podcast. Mm-hmm. I am loving this conversation with you. Um, so, so you, you have doctor in front of your name and you wrote your dissertation on developing discernment in an age of distraction. And Mm -hmm. man, I think discernment is one thing that more and more parents need to, we all need discernment. Um, but I see a lack of discernment in a lot of people Mm -hmm. today. Um, and, and also even for myself, oftentimes I find that I'm not as discerning as I need to be. And, and this is one of the things I love about my husband is that the Lord has truly gifted him Hmm. with discernment. And so he oftentimes will be like, okay, let's rethink this idea (laughs) that you're, that you've got going on. Um, so talk, talk to us about this developing discernment in an age of distraction. Yeah. It's my, it's my life's work, uh, 12 years. And, um, um, it starts in Proverbs chapter one, one through nine, uh, chapter one, uh, something is, um, is different than what people are used to seeing in Proverbs. John chapters one, one through seven is an introduction. Um, it actually starts in verse eight. Here, my son, this, the whole book is divided into my son statements. Mm-hmm. Each time my son appears, something new is being taught. There are 12 wisdom lessons. A child has to pass all 12 lessons in order to reach the level of discernment, which is found in chapter nine. When he reaches chapter nine, he has the highest level of discernment and the discernment that he gains in chapter nine is discerning who the Holy One is, which is Jesus. So he gets to understand who Jesus is. He is God and um, he's the wisdom of God. And, um, and they end up having a personal relationship with him as opposed to, in contrast to folly. Folly and wisdom both offer almost identical things, only folly offers a substitute. She um, She's an emulator, but she always provides something that is is uh, it's an imitation. It's not the real thing. For example, in chapter nine, uh, wisdom offers um, bread that she's made herself. She offers mixed wine. She offers sla- uh, slaughtered beef, um, prime rib. She sets her table. She does all these things. Folly sits at the side of her door. She does nothing. She's lazy. She offers stolen water and she offers hidden bread. Um, all of it is a facade, but all of it is enticing, lustful, and draws the unsuspecting simple person into her realm so that they are forever in her hold. And we want to make sure the most important thing we will teach our children, number one, have a relationship with the God of the universe, Jesus. And number two, to be able to discern between good and evil. We just read in the last uh, session about um, the end Ecclesiastes talks about we'll be held accountable to whatever is good or evil in our lives. It goes all the way back to Genesis with Adam and Eve. She was unable to discern between good and evil. They had the, tr- the knowledge of the tree of good and evil before them, and she couldn't discern the deception of, of the serpent. And so Proverbs starts off, so I, I, can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Teaching our children how to discern is one of the most important things we'll teach our children, much more than science, math, English, and history. Even those things are extremely important. Right. Discernment is the highest level of thinking. One through seven. There are four people that are mentioned here. Here they are. Number one, there's the simple person. It's in the middle of this introduction, the simple person. The second person is a youthful person who gains knowledge. The second, third person is a wise person who increases learning. And the fourth person is a discerning person who gains by, by it costing him something. He gains discernment by hanging around with other wise 
people. Um, he obtains wise guidance, the Bible says. So you got four people mentioned here in the introduction, simple, youthful, knowledgeable, wise, and discerning, those four people. In chapter, in verse 7, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and correction. The word instruction, please, please, please translate it as correction. It's more important. Co being corrected is the key to discernment. A children who lack correction, and we're, well, by the way, we're living in a day when people don't want to spank their children. And I'm not, there, there's, you know, you don't want to hurt your child. You want to be abusive, but you got to follow God's rules. Right. And, 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 but don't spank a child for character flaws. You spank a child for purposeful disobedience after mercy's been exhausted. You know, loving children and, and, dis, and disciplining children, it takes a lot of time and effort to do that. And we got to do it right. Um, I didn't do it right when I raised my children. I was very, very forceful. And so now we live, now that I see the Bible and the way it's written, God's character emphasizes his mercy is a thousand times greater than his judgment. And I wanted my children to see my 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 and God's grace more than I, they saw my judgment. And unfortunately, I didn't do it the right way. So I'm just telling parents now, you know, we don't do the punishment stage until we've exhausted, you know, the discipline, which is correction, mm -hmm. you know, and then the reproof, that's a little bit stronger. And then, you know, then the punishment. But you don't do that until you've exhausted correction and then the reproof. And that's what he brings into chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. He says this, he says in verse 22, how, how long, you simple ones, will you remain simple? How long will you mockers delight in your mocking? And how long will you fools hate knowledge? They hate mm -hmm. knowledge. The fear right. of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools hate knowledge. You've got, here's the key to this whole thing. You've got six people here. You've got the simple, and the simple is, def, by Hebrew definition, is a thoughtless, naive, easily enticed, gullible person. Mm -hmm. Everyone starts off that way. We don't want our children to stay simple. We want them to grow to the next level, which is knowledgeable, youthful person. They gain knowledge and they get increase in learning. But if you don't grow in knowledge, the next step backwards is becoming a mocker. Mockers delight in their mocking. They put other people down because of their own insecurity. That's what they do. And then the next level after mockers is fools. They hate knowledge. So we don't want our children to ever go in that direction. And that's where the gangs become gang members. That's, they, they start be simple. They believe anything. They're gullible. They're, they're naive. They're thoughtless. They move quickly into a mocking type of character. And then they move quickly into a foolish one where they start to hate knowledge. They become a rule unto themselves. We want our children to grow simple and then they start to be corrected, and uh, they start to grow in knowledge. And as soon as they grow in knowledge, they start gaining some wisdom, and after wisdom, they gain discernment. Mm -hmm. Here's the key. This is ready? Yep. We're, chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, I love this. Turn at my reproof. There's that heavier word for correction. Mm -hmm. you can, I can tell you how a child is going to end in their life. I can tell you what they're going to be like 40 years from now by their willingness to be corrected? Do they embrace correction? Do they see it as an opportunity of growth or do they see it as a rejection? Do they see it as someone who's putting them down and they're like always resisting it? Children who resist correction at an early age are gonna have difficulty in their life. They're the ones that usually go in the direction of meeting their needs um, in improper ways. But children who start receiving correction at an early age, and this is so important because parents have to model this they have to emulate it because they have to show a child that they're willing to be corrected. But if they're always talking about somebody, against something, against the pastor, against the, 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 um, the boss at work, if they're always coming home and talking against things, mm -hmm. they have become a mocker in their own home and their children will pick it up. Right. So here's the key. Verse 23, chapter 1. Turn in my reproof. And I, this is wisdom, talk, by the way. The Father's teaching the first lesson. Wisdom's teaching this next lesson. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit to you. I'll make known my words to you. God will pour out his spirit through wisdom and make his words known to us if we're willing to be corrected. And he gives two lessons. I'll just give you these two quick lessons. The first lesson is my son, verse 8. Listen to what your father... You ready? My son, hear your father's correction. That's the first lesson. Hear your father's correction. The word here in Hebrew is the word for obey. Obey your father's correction and listen to the teaching of your mother. Mom and dad are the very first lesson. Lesson number two, verse 10. Choose your friends wisely. 
Um, your friends will say, come with us. We're all together in this. Um, I, I love it. Do I have two minutes to tell you what this is going to mean? Absolutely. You ready? Yep. So he goes, he goes, he gives you this illustration. He goes, in, in vain, the net, is brought, the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Be careful of the friends that you hang around with because you will become like your friends. It's a it's 100% guaranteed. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15, that bad company corrupts good morals. Yep. Here, he uses this parable as an illustration that the net is spread in vain in the sight of any bird. And I thought, okay, well, what dumb bird is going to come down into a net? You put the net down there, and even birds know that they're not going to go into a net that's spread there. Guess what, Yvette? It's the opposite meaning. It doesn't mean that. You ready? Yeah. In Hebrew, the word vain there is not havel. It's the word for it doesn't make sense. That's what it means. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to put a net down in front of a bird. But if you put food down on that net, mm -hmm. those, okay. greedy, those greedy birds will come right into that net and you can take those birds. It doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any difference if, they're, if, they're, um, if they see the net. Birds are greedy. The word for bird in there in Hebrew is not the word for bird. It's the word, ready for this? Lord of the wing. I love wow. it. Yeah, it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of Lord of the Rings, but yeah. <laughs> Lord of the wing. They're masters of the air, but because they did not master their desires, uh -huh. they'd have no discernment about being caught on the ground. They're masters of the air, but they're, they're undiscerning of the danger of the ground. You get a bird in the air, they're, they're unpenetrable. You get them on the ground, greedy for the food, and God says, you hang around with friends. It won't even, it, it'll happen quickly before you even know it. You'll be trapped just like the bird. Wow. And then the, the third lesson is, listen, behold, turn to my correction. The first three lessons, obey correction from your dad, choose your friends wisely, and turn it correction. And God says, I'll pour out my spirit to you. I'll make known my words to you. And then a child is on his way to a healthy level of discerning between good and evil. <laughs> it's as if... The word of God is full of wisdom it is. and instruction. It, it, it is. It is. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. What we do at IEW is break through the, the noise of the grammar and the writing prompts. And we say, this is what you do step by step. And I've witnessed it over and over again, both watching Andrew teach and hearing from parents. This is the best writing program. We've made it so easy and made it really affordable. So any mom can teach writing to their children using our course, and we guarantee it. To try three weeks of free lessons, visit IEW.com. We are back with Dr. Mark Hamby. Um, you know, before the break, it, it's so incredible to see scripture broken apart like that. And, and for those who maybe don't know what you're doing, there is a word study, and you're looking at the original Hebrew, and you're picking apart, like, what did what did the writer of this book actually mean when Solomon wrote mm -hmm. the book of Proverbs? What really was he writing and what did mm -hmm. he mean? And, and it's why when we read our Bible, we don't read it through one time. You uh -huh. didn't read it through one time 40 <laughs> years ago and go, okay, I'm done. You know, a typical book, you know, if I'm going to read Teddy's button here, I will read it through one time and I may or may not read it again, but I will probably move on to a different book next time. I'm not going to read mm -hmm. it. And then started over from the beginning again. But with God's word, there's so much power in it. And there's so much to be learned and taught. And it's just incredible mm. how God speaks to us through Amen. the power of his word. So parents, if you're not reading the Bible to and with your kids and studying God's word together as a family, you know, you, you said it, you said it earlier, Mark, there is nothing more important than teaching our kids discernment and God's word. It, the, the academics that we teach our kids are important, but these things are the most important. Kids have to understand who God is as their creator and why that even matters in mm -hmm. their life. And that's where the discernment comes in. Right? And, and, and well, so not everybody is cut out to do this like I do it. Okay. So I'm right. a story, I'm a storyteller. Sure. I, uh, you know, I could sell worms in, in the desert. <laughs> you know, I, I love the word of God and it just keeps getting better and better, but not every parent can do what I do. And so what, what I have seen wor work well, for example, um, there was a, um, I was listening to um, a podcast last week and um, this wife, very controlling, dominating wife, she was um, putting her husband down for years because he wasn't being the spiritual leader of his home. 
And, um, you know, she, they went to counseling and they couldn't have this breakthrough until they brought the whole family in. And the kids were asked, you know, because the problem was about devotions. The father did not like doing devotions. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, the wife was just kept putting her husband down in front of the kids. And so finally the counselor asked the kids, um, what is it about dad's devotions that you don't like or do like? And what is it about mom's devotions that you like or don't like? And the kids spoke up and said, we don't like mom's devotions. We like dad's. And the wife was like, what? <laughs> you know, this can't be. And, and he looked at his wife and he said, well, I, I don't do devotions like sit down in the morning and open up the Bible. He goes, he goes, and then one of the boys spoke up. He goes, yeah, dad does devotions like when we're riding in the car or we're on the four-wheeler or when we're fishing right. or when we're hiking. Dad does devotions during, he's given us these snippets of truth from the right. Bible. He doesn't make it long like you do, mom. And we love the way dad does it, you know? And I thought, that's really cool. Not everyone has to do it the same way. And so what we've done here at Lamplighter is, you know, God has allowed us to package his word in the form of books, in audios, and in teaching. Lamplighter is like a, a um, what, what do they call a uh, Trojan horse, you know? People say, what, what do you do at Lamplighter? Well, we print, publish books. You know, if you've never been here at Lamplighter, it is unbelievable. We have our own printing and bindery section here oh, wow. where we make our own books by hand. Um, we have our own recording studio inside an eight, a 19th century, 1853 organ. Inside the organ, people, we record, that's where we do our recording, bringing in John Reese Davies from Lord of the Rings, you know, from Europe, and they go into this organ. It's the only one of its kind in the world. You know, we have a cafe. It's just this whole place is kind of like 19th century-ish and wow. fireplace. Like our our college students are downstairs right now in the cafe sitting in front of a, a wood fire. You know, it's just wow. beautiful. So Where are you located? We're in western New York, right a mile away from the Grand Canyon of the East. Wow. It's gorgeous here. We're in the Finger Lakes. I okay. love it here. We're in this little tiny town that we're trying to br bring light into the midst of this dark world that we live yeah. in. It's it's phenomenal. We love it here. We got 60 acres, waterfalls and ponds and trees. Oh my. But here's the key. I've decided that that a long time ago that we need, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know, it's the word of God that we've got to get into people's lives. And there's no better way from what my perspective than to bring the word of God into people's lives through stories. Because that's how Jesus taught. Mm -hmm. He taught the word through stories. He took Old Testament scripture. And they brought it into life and with a new story. And so I thought, wow, let's do that. So God, without me even searching for these books, I have now 250 books, and we're in our 33rd audio drama. We're doing three more right now. And igniting the theater of the mind, igniting the, the, um, the imagination of a child when they read these things, and then have the Word of God just threaded throughout, woven throughout these stories. For example, um, here's one of them, Basket of Flowers. It's the first book you've had, I ever read. Um, it it blew me away. Other than the Bible, it blew me away. Um, it's the story of a fa of a father teaching his daughter all the principles of godliness through his flowers in the garden. He's the king's gardener. But one day, Mary goes to the goes to the 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 castle, giving the queen these beautiful flowers from her father's garden. She sets Mary aside in her room. Says, "I have a gift for you." Mary gets the gift, goes home. And um, shows her father this beautiful flower dress. But what Mary didn't realize is that when the queen left the room, the queen took her diamond ring off and set it on the dresser. When the queen gave Mary the gift and let Mary go, she turned to get her ring and the ring was missing and no one was in the room at the time except for Mary. And the penalty from stealing from royalty is death. She's now, as the father's teaching her, she is being beaten by the guards to, get, to tell, the, tell us where the ring is. She's brought before the judge and the judge tells her if she would just be willing to admit to stealing the ring, he'll release her. But her father looks at her and says, Mary, I see in your face the face of innocence. It's better to die for the truth than to live for a lie for the worst pillow to sleep on is the pillow of a guilty conscience. And I'm like, mm. whoa. Wow. Yvette, Yvette, when I read that, I was in tears. I was weeping. I was reading it to my 12-year-old daughter, and I realized I did not possess the character that this father possessed, and I wanted that. Yeah. And so God just kept bringing books into my life, the hedge of thorns. Um, it's a story of, have you, have you read this book? I have not. Okay. True story, 1611. Father tells his son not to go near this hedge of thorns. It's 12, 12 feet um, high, 
It's six feet wide. It's a mile long. Don't go near the hedge of thorns. But when you're told not to do something, it right. <laughs> entices you all the more. Right. He thinks there's a vineyard on the other side, apple orchard. He's going to bring fruit home to his mom and dad, and he's going to celebrate, and they're going to make apple pie. And so he gets his little sister, Belle, to get through the hole because the, the thorns are six inches long and razor blade sharp. He can't get through anymore. He's all cut up. He's been lying to his father. We got all his scratches. So he gets this little sister who's now eight years old, Belle. She, he loves her. She crawls through the hedge, but she tell, but father doesn't want us to do this. It's all right, Belle, go through. So she gets halfway through, but the thorns are now pricking her. John, please pull me out. Instead of pulling her out in this fit of passion, he takes the palms of his hands, the back of her shoes, and pushes her as hard as he can. Mm. And when he does that, the thorns drive into her face and into her eyes. Oh. Pulls her out, realizes what he did. He may have blinded his sister, runs her home. The mother stops the bleeding just in time. The next morning, the father takes his son to the same site where he had pushed his sister through, lifts him up on the palms of his hands, up over so he can see what's on the other side of the hedge of thorns. And when he sees when he sees what's on the other side of the hedge of thorns, he is blown away because on the, and it changes his life forever because on the other side of the hedge of thorns, there is, you're going to have to read the book. Oh no. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that true. is not fair. <laughs> true, wait, true story. Can you imagine reading stuff like this? Every, all 250 books are just like that. They're filled with mystery, oh my intensity, drama, and they're filled with the word of God. And so, Kent, <laughs> are you she... really going to leave me with that cliffhanger? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, then I'm going to have to require you to send me that book because. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Or you want, you can listen in the audio drama. But here's or the that. key. Here's the key. You surround your children with characters, yeah. heroes and heroines, both who learn lessons of blessing and reward because they do it the right way, and also those that learn by consequences, learning yeah. it the wrong way. It is essential that our children are surrounded. These things will implant in their mind and in their heart and in their soul, yes. in, in their conscience, so that when they're faced with similar things, they will make the best and right decisions. Yes. That's training them, training their level of decision, uh, uh, the, the, their level of discernment. Listen to this. This is so key. It's Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. It says this, everyone that lives on milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness because he's a child. Um, but solid food is for the mature, for those that have had their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Yeah, That's what we need for our children. Y Yvette, I have, I have a dozen books sitting, sitting on my shelf. If you've got a teenager, Ishmael is one of the best books I have ever come across for teenagers. If, you've, if there are men out there that are not readers, Ned Franks is a trilogy. It is... It, it deals with manliness. What does it take to be a real man? Um, Sir Knight of the Splendid Way, this book here was given to me by a missionary in Africa. She said it was like getting a kiss from God her, 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 himself. I can't tell you. It's better than Pilgrim's Progress. That's how powerful yeah. the book is. It's, it changed my life. These books, Teddy's Button, you raised it up earlier, uh -huh. the best children's book I've ever come across in my life. Um, our children need to be surrounded with stories that are permeated with the Word of God that will help them grow. And so we went from publishing these books to Lamplighter Theater, bringing the best actors in the world, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Downton Abbey, Chronicles of Narnia. We bring the actors here to Lamplighter headquarters. We record these stories so the theater of the mind can grow. And then I thought, well, what's the next step? We need to start a college. And we started our own college here. This is our second year. Our mission is to create a renaissance, or to ignite a renaissance of creative excellence that inspires one to know God intimately, proclaim Him passionately, and enjoy Him infinitely. Wow. This has been the best time of my life. I'm, we bring teachers in from around the world that know the Word of God. We, we've got a Supreme Court state justice coming here next week, in a couple of weeks, to teach um, Constitution, Law, and the Bible. Unbelievable. Wow. It, um, we've got theology teachers here, art teachers. Our students right now are in, in visual arts class, learning oil painting from a master teacher. We bring script writers. They do Adventures in Odyssey, Lampletter Theater. Um, we do write, have, writing is king. Teaching your children how to write is so important. Um, we, we've got photography teachers, culinary teachers, horticulture teachers. Wow. Uh, teachers, we, we want our students, teachers in marketing, we want our, and then our students, when they're here at the college, they do half day of classes, Actually, it's full day of classes. Don't let them know that. And then they do <laughs> half day of work, head, heart, and hands. 
we want them to get to come along side by side with the professionals here at Lamplighter, and they get to see a working ministry. They get to go to the classroom and then work in a ministry and see how it functions. I, I've been planning this for over 20 years because when a child, when a, a young adult actually is, you know, you learn best when you're teaching something. When yes. they're involved practically in hands-on, we got young people here in this college, they're doing some of the marketing, they're doing the social media. You should see what they're doing. It's unbelievable. Yeah. They're, they're working in the bindery. They're putting books together. They're working in editing. They're, they're, they're ev- reviewing books. They're, they're involved in horticulture. They're, they're involved in removing snow when we had a foot of snow last week. You know? <laughs> no, we're all working together yeah. and they get to enjoy the reward right. of hard work of diligently seeking truth in the word of God yeah. and then collaborating together in producing something new and beautiful. And it's it's been a dream come true. That's absolutely incredible. And working for God's kingdom, there's no better thing no, than doing that. There isn't, so, there isn't. Wow, so much good stuff. Thank you so much for You're sharing welcome. with us this week. This has been so encouraging and exciting. And man, I just, I, I stand in awe of the guests that God brings on this podcast. And oh, so we amen. really appreciate your time this week. Thank you. And if, um, they, if people want to um, get a catalog of all of the books and resources, the audio dramas, they can go to lamplighter.net okay. and uh, look at it there, or they can call us toll free, um, 888-1888, the letter A, gospel, and they can request it for free. And um, we'll, I love, um, we have students here answering the phones and um, customer service, and they'll tell people exactly what's the best for their age and, yeah. char- and certain character traits they're looking to develop in their children. Okay, that's awesome. We'll put all of those links in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us this week, Mark. We really appreciate your time. And thank you guys for listening. I hope you have been encouraged this week as I have been. If you have not left a review for the podcast, please do that for us. We would really appreciate it and share this with your friends. I know that they're going to be encouraged by it as well. Have a great rest of your day. We will be back with you on Monday with another fantastic guest. See you then. Bye. In the very beginning, I had several friends that wanted me to homeschool. And frankly, they were a reason why I didn't want to homeschool because it looked too perfect to me. Like I would look at families on the covers of magazines and they had matching jumpers and they were all playing an instrument. And I was thinking, I can't, I can't relate to that, right? They're growing their own wheat and grinding it into flour. And I thought, I, that's not me. Like I'm, I'm going to the store and you know, getting Wonder Bread for my kids and trying to figure out how to use my crock pot, right? And I realized very quickly that the best thing about homeschooling wasn't the fact that we had it all together. It was the fact that we were learning to live together, the fact that we were learning to grow together and learn together. And we learned through our mistakes. I want my kids to know two things when they leave my house. I want them to know that I loved them. That's the first thing I want. I want. I don't want them to look back on their years at home and wonder if I love them. I want them to know that I love them. The second thing is that I want them to know that I trusted the Lord that I trusted God for every decision that I make. And when I make a wrong decision, which we do as parents, and when the day goes bad, and when we burn the dinner, and when we stub our toe, and when our kids push us to the end of what we think we can do, and we say the word that we never thought we'd hear come out of our mouth, or we make a wrong decision, we have an opportunity to go back and make it right.